In 1169, the first Normans landed in Ireland. More arrived the following year. They were very quickly successful and in the next years and decades spread all over the country. While, in a superficial overview of the early years of the Norman invasion, it may seem like this period consisted of unending successes for the Normans, this is actually wrong. The Normans faced periods of great difficulty. Some were related to the complicated relationship between Henry II, King of England, and overlord of the adventurers who landed in Ireland, notably Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, better known as Strongbow. In addition, between May and September 1171, they ran into great difficulties in Dublin, having to fight two battles, one against the Norse and the other against Gaelic forces, and also being besieged. Indeed, for a while in the summer of 1171, things looked quite bleak for Strongbow and his supporters. Since the 10th century, Dublin had been the most important city in Ireland. A north city in the region between the Gaelic Kingdom of Leinster and the Southern Enail, it was a great source of soldiers and money. More importantly, control of Dublin became essential to anyone claiming to be High King of Ireland. Vikings from Dublin prevented Enail kings on various occasions from establishing what could have become a more powerful Irish national monarchy, such as Neil Glundov, killed at the Battle of Island Bridge in 919. For a video on this, click here. It was thus only natural that the Normans, together with Dermot MacMurrah, would move to take Dublin. They took it by storm in September 1170, forcing Askel MacRagnall, King of Dublin, to flee in his ships. Ominously, he promised to return. After this, Strongbow tried to strengthen his position, sending men to plunder in Mead. Then, in May 1171, Dermot MacMurrah died opening the question of who would succeed him as King of Leinster. Since Strongbow had married Dermot's daughter, he claimed the throne, though there were other claimants. Strongbow's claim was not fully justified under English or Gaelic law. While he was trying to succeed Dermot, other troubles began to build up. In the south of Ireland, the resurgent McCarthy's of Desmond were threatening Waterford. Elsewhere, Rory O'Connor and Ternan O'Rourke were preparing their forces to move against the Normans. Making matters worse, in England, King Henry issued a proclamation forbidding any ships from sailing to Ireland and ordering his subjects to return by Easter. Strongbow had to dispatch Raymond Le Gras to placate Henry. The only good news came from the north. The death of Conor McLaughlin meant that the Kennel Owen would be distracted over the succession instead of looking southwards and attacking the Normans. Worst news came in May 1171. Askel MacRagnall returned to Dublin, bringing an army with him. He is said to have had between 60 and 100 ships, depending on the source. He had recruited his army in the Isle of Man and the Scottish Isles. It's hard to know for definite how many men he had, but if we take an average around 30 per ship, this gives a figure of between 1,800 and 3,000 men. This seems to be a reasonable guess for the number of Norse or Vikings who arrived in Dublin. However, one source, the famous Song of Dermot and the Earl, gives a much higher figure, 20,000 men. Obviously, this is an exaggeration. Indeed, most army sizes stated in the documentation this time have to be taken with several grains of salt. In relation to the Norman force, Hayes McCoy estimated that in Dublin their force consisted of 200 knights, 400 other horsemen and around 1500 archers or infantry. Not all of these took part in the battle, since some would have remained within the city. Askell's men would have been all foot. Many of these were experienced troops, and since some seemed to have been heavily armoured, they would probably have been able to withstand an attack by the Norman cavalry. Apart from the Song of Dermot and the Earl, the other main account of the Battle of Dublin was written by Geraldus Cambrensius, who was definitely not a neutral writer. According to him, the Norse were, quote, all warriors armed in the Danish fashion, some having long breastplates and other shirts of mail. Their shields were round and painted red, end quote. 
if Geraldus Cambrensis is accurate here, many of these warriors would have been well armoured and able to form a shield wall. Cambrensis also says that the Norse force was led by someone called John the Wood, which he states means John the Mad. This John was supposed to be from Norway, and also be to be the nephew of the King of Norway. The geography of Dublin at this stage was quite different from the present. The city itself was on the south bank of the Liffey. On the west, it began more or less at what is now Lower Bridge Street in the Liberties, near the Brazen Head. Also near here, there was probably a bridge across the river, somewhere close to where Matt Talbert Bridge is now. Eastwards, the city ran to Parliament Street. Within the city, if indeed we can call it this, the high ground on which Dublin Castle was afterwards built was central. Near Parliament Street, marking the eastern boundary of the city, was the River Poddle. This flowed into the Liffey nearby. One of the main gates into the city was also here. Also very different at this time was Dublin east of O'Connell Bridge. The Liffey was much wider here. Indeed, Askell's ships are said to have pulled up at the Stain. According to Hayes McCoy, this was an open space near the current Trinity College and marked by a stone pillar. Probably, this was near where Townsend Street or Pier Street are now. Currently, there is a replica stone outside Pier Street Guard Station. It was sculpted by Cleaner Cousin, who also made the memorial in Dunanor. This can be taken to be an approximate site of where the Norse force landed in Dublin, or better, outside of Dublin. Askell seems to have moved quickly to attack Dublin, perhaps even on the same day he landed. The nearest gate into the city was the gate of St. Mary del Dam. According to Hayes McCoy, it is named after a mill dam at the mouth of the Poddle. This gate was located near the top of Dame Street. In 1175 a church was built there, in which Lambert Simnel would be proclaimed Edward VI of England much later. In the 16th and 17th century, this church would come into the possession of same f some famous owners, including George Carew and Richard Boyle. Ultimately, the present city hall was built there. So, in order to reach the gate, Askell's men must have moved along somewhere close to the present Dame Street. Although the Song of Dermot and the Earl says Askell had 10,000 men, this is undoubtedly an exaggeration. The same source also says that the Norman commander, Miles G. Coggan, sortied with 300 men. Again, this is doubtful. Probably a larger number of Normans were involved in the fighting. However, it is important to point out that not all of the garrison would have sortied. Nevertheless, it seems that the Normans were outnumbered. As Askell's men moved towards the city gate, the Normans came out, choosing to fight outside rather than remain inside the city. Strongbow was not in Dublin at this time, so the garrison was led by Miles Duke Hogan. Undoubtedly, shortly after he led his men outside the walls, the battle commenced, and the two forces clashed quickly. The following fighting must have been pretty brutal. Both sides had large numbers of armoured soldiers. Both would have had some archers, though probably they were more on the Norman side and these were more deadly. Undoubtedly, the Norse formed a shield wall, a formation often used at that time. From the sources, it seems that the Normans were fighting on foot. Neither the ground, the space, nor the enemy they were facing were conducive to a cavalry attack. The fighting went on for some time and must have been very bloody. Armoured soldiers clashed head-on, using swords and axes against each other. Initially, it appears that the Normans came off worse, probably because they were outnumbered. As I said, the fighting was ferocious. One Norman appears to have had his leg cut off by a single stroke of a battle-axe. The song of Dermot and the Earl says this was done by John de Wode, who is also said to have killed and round another ten English. In this heavy fighting, the Normans were pushed back. However, they refused to break and still held on. Although their position seemed desperate, Miles Jukogan had an ice up his sleeve. 
he had sent his brother Richard with thirty knights out the west gate of the city. These were mounted and rode fast around the city and fell on the Norse force in the rear. Askell's men were taken by surprise. Heavily engaged with the Normans in front of them, they appear to been, have been unable to turn around to face the horsemen coming from behind. The Norman cavalry must have shattered the Norse force, collapsing the shield wall. Askell's men were routed and fled. As in the case of all battles where one side broke and fled, there were heavy casualties. Richard de Cogan is said to have captured John de Wode and executed him afterwards. However, the Song of Dermot and the Earl says John was killed on the battlefield. Oscar was captured. In the account in the Song of Dermot and the Earl, it says that he was captured and then executed. However, Geraldus Cambrensius says that after being captured, Miles Jacogan offered to release him. Oscar scoffed at this, saying he would return with an even larger force of men. Then, due to his insolence, Miles had Oscar beheaded. Probably the Song of Dermot and the Earl is more correct here. Oscar was captured and executed. It would have been foolish to let him go. He could have been imprisoned, but undoubtedly he had supporters in the city. Hence, he was executed. Geraldus' account may have been trying to put a better spin in this execution of a prisoner or provide a justification for it. In his account, Geraldus Cambrensius inserted at this point a speech by Morris Fitzgerald. Obviously, this is propaganda, but part of it is still worth citing, since it refers to problems of identity that the Normans were encountering, at least when Geraldus was writing some years later, one that would continue until the end of the 17th century. Cambrensius reports Morris Fitzgerald as stating, quote, Such is our lot that what the Irish are to the English, we too, being now considered as Irish, are the same. The one island does not hold us in greater detestation than the other. Away then with hesitation and cowardice, and let us boldly attack the enemy, while our short stock of provisions yet supplies us with sufficient strength. Fortune favours the brave, and a well-armed or scanty force inured to war and animated by the recollection of former triumphs, may yet crush this rude and disorderly rabble. End quote. Hayes McCoy sums this up as, quote, We are Englishmen to the Irish, and Irishmen to the English. End quote. Whether or not Fitzgerald's speech is real, Strongbow decided to sort he out. He was helped here by a decision of O'Connor to weaken his force. A large part of the besiegers were sent south to raid Leinster, while another part was sent north to cut crops to ensure the Normans could not get them. In other words, O'Connor weakened his force just before the Normans decided to attack. The Normans rode out of Dublin in the middle of the day. We do not know the precise date, but it was sometime in September. They were divided into three battles. Raymond Legras had twenty knights with him, Miles Jacobin had 30, while Strongbow and Mars Fitzgerald had 40. Probably they were accompanied by other troops, mostly mounted. Initially, the Normans crossed the Liffey, heading towards Finglas. Somewhere near the River Talca, they turned, and then fell on Rory O'Connor's camp in the present Castle Knock. O'Connor was taken by surprise. The Normans reported that he was bathing, but this is probably fanciful. Caught completely unawares, O'Connor's forces were routed. Strongbow's forces returned to Dublin in triumph. Along with them, they brought a lot of captured supplies and other plunder. The siege was broken. O'Connor had no option but to fall back. However, the situation would change yet again, fortune turning Strongbow's way. At the end of the month, Strongbow discovered he was no longer in the king's bad books. Indeed, he was summoned to meet King Henry in Pembroke in Wales. In October, Henry landed in Waterford. A new stage in the Norman intervention had begun. To close this video, I would like to give a shout out to two friends of mine who have novels about this period. 
Rua Butler and his Invader series, and Larry McLaughlin's The Four Kings of Ireland. Both are very interesting fictional accounts which provide insights into this turbulent period. I highly recommend them.